Hello guys, welcome back to Custom Gamer. My name is Daz and this is the show where we talk about level design while playing cool maps. Today we've got a new Quake One map by Sock, aka Simon O'Callaghan. This was the guy who created In the Shadows, which is a mod I had a look at on Custom Gamer about a month or two ago. A very very high quality mod with kind of new models, textures, game mechanics and everything. There are a couple of assets reused here from In the Shadows. There's a couple of things like health pickups and uh, ammo packs and things like that, which you probably recognise from In the Shadows. But aside from that, this is just a standalone map. And uh, I wanted to have a look at it because it's got just some really, really great pieces of design in it, which uh, I want to talk about. The map is called Midnight Stalker, and let's get started. Okay, so we've got our skill select. Uh, Simon used some kind of black magic here to combine the skill select and the map into a single BSP. <laughs> Guessing it's some kind of custom code he wrote to do that, but it threw me off. I, I figured my demo would be broken. I figured they loaded a second map here. But no, it works. I just had to use Quake's buzzer to play it back. Which is why some, some things here might look a bit funky, like the the uh, status bar is a bit bigger than it normally is in my videos, it's because I'm using a different engine to record with. So this map is fairly classical in terms of Quake standards in that it's very kind of like a labyrinthine, uh, kind of dark, you know, corridors, small rooms, kind of very very kind of close encounters and things like that, usually involving small amounts of enemies but with well designed areas to incorporate them. I kind of like there's a secret right at the start that's fairly easy to work out. You kind of give a give the play, whet the player's appetite, I suppose you could say, for kind of finding secrets. Uh, it certainly got me to look around more. I, I know I found at least one extra secret into the map just because uh, that secret at the beginning got me to look up at the ceilings to look for uh, buttons and hidden things like that. Now this map is pretty difficult on hard, it gave me a really good challenge. I did manage to finish it first time, but it was certainly pretty close in certain areas. Here's the area where I decided to look around and look at the ceiling to try and find extra secrets, and uh, lo and behold, there is another red button up on the, up on the ceiling. And this got me searching just about for every kind of surface which could be a button or something so I end up smacking a lot of things around in, in this demo. This is my first playthrough of the map so uh, you're getting kind of raw. This isn't my second time through recording specially for this video or anything. Really interesting use of the silver key here. I mean, it's. I almost feel like I should have used a button or something there instead. Uh, I always feel like uh, keys, especially in Quake, are always kind of like a long term goal. Like you, you show the player a key door and then they go and search for a key. That's kind of one of the ways you can kind of pace your map out and uh, provide goals for the player. There, it's kind of. You see the silver key door and the silver key is like pretty much right next to it. Uh, Sock brought up an interesting comment in the uh, release thread on Funk about this. He was saying that uh, kind of pressing buttons to open doors and things like that, there's kind of a disconnect with the player. Like that sometimes you, you don't quite connect the two together, so you don't quite have a, uh, I suppose, a kind of cause and effect style thing. Whereas uh, with a key, you kind of you know that by finding the key, you've got access to this door now, and it's uh, it's a lot more understandable. Yeah, I mean, I understand what he's talking about, but I'm, I'm just not sure if I like keys being used in such a short-term way like that. This combat area I really, really like. Uh, so you've got the two vaults at the other side. And uh, this, this area is kind of really multi-leveled. It's quite interesting fighting vaults like this, because if you drop down to the bottom section here, you're kind of... 
boxing yourself in in a way, even though there's kind of health and armor down there that you can pick up. And uh, I really like the pillars in the center of the room as well, it gives you lots of cover to kind of uh, break line of sight with the Vols or get rid of their Vol balls, which can be quite tricky to get rid of if there's no cover. Now, if I'd been more observant, I probably would have noticed that one of the Vors was standing in a death pit. Uh, these are typically denoted in Quake by the use of like blood textures all over the place, and uh, the fact that there's giant spikes above it should give it away as well. I didn't quite notice them though, unfortunately. So there's actually a button you can press next to this Vore here, and it'll, I'm guessing it'll crush the other one. Like so. But yeah, I just killed them all in a more conventional manner. So I really like the use of Scrags and Knights here in the kind of second wave of the fight. So you've got the Knights, which are always trying to close in and melee you. And then you've got the uh, Scrags, which kind of act like a turret almost, kind of shooting you from afar. It creates a nice dynamic that the player has to choose kind of which ones they want to deal with first. So if they concentrate on the Knights, then they've got to be wary of all this uh, acid spit coming in from afar from the Scrags. And of course, if they deal with the Scrags first, then they've got to, I guess, use the environment to kind of dodge the knights while they're doing that. It's always nice if your combat scenarios can kind of, uh, if there's different viable strategies for dealing with it like that, other than just a single way to do it. This next area here is quite interesting as well because uh, Sock uses a kind of shambler in a turret position as well. It's kind of up on the second floor in a little alcove. And I, I really like the use of shamblers like this because they can't really move, they're always in the same area so you just have to kind of avoid their lightning bolts and kind of time out how long it's been between the last time they fired and so you kind of know if you're safe or not. Now you typically don't really see a lot of shamblers used like this. I mean. There's sometimes like above you, but they have plenty of room to kind of run around. You're never really sure where they are. Uh, having them in a kind of fixed position like this, it, it makes them less uh, dangerous, but it just means you can introduce them earlier in the level, I guess, when the player's got less advanced weaponry. It makes them easier to deal with with uh, these piddly little guns I've got at the moment. <laughs> a nice another little hidden secret here. Nice little red armor hidden away in there. This is quite funny, I was kind of trying to jump from the uh, Shambler's little perch up into that, that other second floor alcove there. And it wasn't quite going right for me. <laughs> it looks like it's just about in range if you get the jump just right, but yeah, not quite. Turns out if I'd just gone through the teleporter, this one, the second teleporter here, it brings me right there. So. <laughs> I'm always kind of hesitant when I, when there's kind of a secret, or I think there's a secret in a room that I haven't found yet, I'm always hesitant using teleporters because I always feel like it's going to take me to a new part of the map or something, I'm not going to be able to get back. grab ourselves another silver key. I love how the whole entranceway opens up when you pick it up. I wasn't expecting it. I thought I'd be safe from all these people here, but that was quite fun when it opened up and let that guy in. <laughs> this brings us back to the entry hall where we were at the start. So I suppose what I was talking about keys earlier, I suppose the gold, the gold key is kind of like the long-term goal in this map, whereas silver keys seem to be a lot more temporary. Mm. 
you know, thinking about it now, I suppose it is quite consistent. We've had two doors now with silver keys kind of right nearby. It's, it's kind of interesting, actually. I'm, I'm agreeing with it more and more as the demo goes on. <laughs> Here we are, lava. No doubt I'll fall in and kill myself. So this area is kind of fun in that you have lots of scrags and a vore which forces a lot of movement out of the player. You can't just kind of stand still and fight these enemies. So combine that with the lava and you get a kind of interesting scenario. Where you have to move around to avoid damage but at the same time you risk falling in if you're not clever, like I almost died there. <laughs> Lost most of my red armor. Never mind. I was kind of hesitant jumping to grab the uh, grenade launcher and the lava there because I didn't want to fall and die. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but I had really a lot of trouble trying to do that jump to get the yellow armor there on that ledge. It took a couple of attempts for me to get it. I'm not sure why, because the third attempt I just kind of just jumped normally and it was fine. <laughs> this area here was kind of annoying, so it looks, th this gap here kind of looks big enough to fit through, it really does. And uh, I, th I hadn't spotted the other entryway here yet, so I was just kind of working out. I thought I was trapped on a clipping plane or something. So I ended up wasting most of my pentagram here, just trying to fit through. Which was a shame. Sad face indeed. <laughs> And we have the gold key, finally. And the gold key door is directly below us at the moment in the first room we entered in the map. There's a nice bit of uh, connecting the layout up there, so you're not kind of searching around for the door after you find the key. I like that. Okay, we'll attempt this jump for the last time. <laughs> Get my hero protection source, indeed. <laughs> Now this lift I really really enjoyed. Some people on Funk weren't so keen on it, but um, I love the fact that you're, you're slowly raised down on this lift. And uh, when you spot the three shamblers waiting for you at the bottom, it's just instant panic. <laughs> I was reading the release thread on Funk, some people kind of panicked and jumped off the lift and ran around. Uh, I just kind of rode it out on the top here. But I love the fact that it stops, because you just get that moment of intense panic, which is, which was great. The shamblers aren't really that difficult to deal with if you just kind of stay up here. Another Ramiro lift here, <laughs> which I suppose gives me some time to talk about uh, first playthrough demos and how they're very very handy for, for map authors to kind of get, get a player feedback on their maps. Because the thing about player feedback is that it's sometimes very very coloured by what they think happened in the map rather than what actually happened. 
Uh, I see this quite a lot throughout the years. People give feedback and then if they did record a demo, the demo actually shows something completely different happening. It's not that they're intentionally lying or distorting the truth or whatever, it's just uh, the kind of their experience uh, as they remember it differs from what actually happened in the map and it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, not everyone here works for game development studios, they don't have the luxury of playtesting, watching hundreds of people play through their maps uh, when their game's getting close to release. And uh, asking for first playthrough demos is something I think a lot of map authors should start doing. Uh, this is something Sock did for this map, he specifically requested in the release that the people record their first playthrough demo and upload it for him. And he got, uh, at the time of making this video, I think he had about 14 or 15 demos of people playing through his map for the first time. And it's just invaluable feedback to find out how different players react to different uh, situations during your map. For instance, this final combat here, Sok was saying that loads of people didn't actually use the spike shooters in the middle at all. They just ran around killing all the enemies. Some people uh, used a lot of monster in the fighting. Other people relied almost entirely on the spike shooters in the middle and just ran around avoiding everything. I kind of do a mixture of all three. <laughs> but uh, I think the point remains that uh, even if authors don't ask for first run demos, usually they're incredibly grateful when they do get them. I know I certainly am, I don't want to speak for everyone here, but if I, when I released my QNSPs and people uploaded demos for me to watch, it was really interesting watching how people played them. Especially watching some of the uh, speed demo archive runs of my uh, second Q1SP it was really, really fun to watch as well. Obviously that's, that's nowhere near a first playthrough demo, but uh, incredibly fun to watch nonetheless. But yeah, I mean, th this, this goes for Quake, Half-Life, any game really that allows you to record demos. Even if you die after five seconds and something to something really, really embarrassing, it doesn't matter. Submit that to the author. I'm sure they'll gladly watch it and be appreciative of people that upload demos for them. It's one of the best ways to see how players actually play your maps. The game camera never lies. <laughs> Okay, so that was Midnight Stalker by Sock. Really, really fun map. Great challenge. Just about got through it on hard on the first try. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.